I have a theory that if you can bring story, symbol, and ritual together, you will be able to understand uh, someone's worldview. And for example, um, I did some work with Abwe, which is the American Baptist World, for World Evangelization out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, Dr. Loffis was their president at that time. And he, uh, this was a seminar or a conference for, uh, well, not a conference, candidate school for uh, their missionaries that were going out. And so he spoke to them. There was a number of them, like 30 or so, and um, that were going to be headed out. And he, he came out and he talked to the group and he began, he brought two symbols out with him. A broken watch, one of those that flip open, and he had a, a piece of bamboo that was about that long, about that big around, and it was about 400 years old. It came from the Philippines. And he said, um, <clears throat> When I took over the presidency of this organization, the former president gave me these two symbols. He gave me a broken watch, and by that he was saying, you only have so much time that you will be in leadership here. So there's a shelf life on your leadership. That's what he was saying to him. And he also gave a baton to him and said, what you want to do is take this organization and move it ahead but eventually somebody else will have to move it further than you can move it. Then you have to pass that baton to that other individual. And what they had out in the middle of the table here, a big table, like, there was about two tables like this, actually three I think, and they laid out um, some of the historical journals of Abwe as a mission agency. And they they had, you know, there were stories, of course, of different people who in the ministries that they had done over the years. And um, his thing was that we are going to give you a baton, and they had nice batons about that long, that big around, and they had one for everyone that was going to the mission field. And he says, here's what I, in his little statement up above here, Here's what I want to happen to this. By God's grace, I will pass this baton to a national. In other words, do not keep the baton. <laughs> Have your ministry and multiply yourself and give that baton to somebody else. I don't want to see that baton in your hands in four years or three years or two years whenever you come back. I want to see that been handed off to somebody else. And hopefully what? They will do the same thing. They will not keep it. They will hand it off. So in other words, what? They have multiplied themselves as well. And then when that happens in five or ten years from now, we're going to have a lot more stories that will be in these journals of how you've handed the baton to somebody else, and they are now taking that ministry and multiplying it. <coughs> So there was your story side of it. The ritual would be then every year they do that for their new candidates and they will review these stories and they will be adding more stories as the people go out and the years pass and the batons are passed off. And those, those stories will be written down in the journals and to be the history for the organization. <clears throat> very, very powerful bringing those three things together, story, symbol, and ritual. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> metaphors. We'll talk about them a little bit. Um, what are some biblical metaphors for servant leadership that we find in Scripture? What are some of those that stand out? It's not real hard, really. I mean, it's pretty simple. <clears throat> For servant leaders, how are, how are servant leaderships def defined metaphorically in Scripture? <clears throat> Is 
It's not that tough, you guys. This is easy. <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> Sheep, right? Sheep are followers, right? Any other ones come to mind? Slaves? Anyone? Yeah. A lot of metaphors in scripture to try to capture what servant leadership is all about. Well, master servant. Master servant. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to metaphors. What is metaphor? This is like that, right? And metaphors are doing what? They, they create tension. They are designed to create tension between two things. This is like that. <clears throat> okay, so a servant leader is like a sheep. A servant leader is like a master. So, uh, what would you call it? Master, what did you say? Master servant. Master servant. So those are metaphors to try to define that. This is like that. <clears throat> okay. Um, one thing that's interesting is that you really can't define a leader or a follower with one metaphor. You have to have a number of metaphors to capture the nuances that are incorporated into those two terms, leaders and followers. And when you start looking at the various metaphors that are in scripture, um, they deal with followership. They deal with followership. They really, you don't get a lot of metaphors on how to do leadership. You know, methodologies, how to be a good leader. 10 steps to be a good leader. 10 steps to be a good follower. No, you get metaphors that you are trying to then implement and this is like that, and you model those, and then you're getting the definitions of it. What's a good steward? What's a good servant? <clears throat> What's a good shepherd? Um, Bible doesn't seem to be real interested in giving us models, as it is to giving us metaphors on how to do these things, which is interesting because if you were writing the book on leadership, probably be much more into methodology <laughs> than metaphors on how to do leadership, how to do followership, how to do servanthood. We'd probably focus uh, a lot stronger in that area. The metaphors, too, um, get into the whole area of relationships. Talks about children, talks about friends, sisters, brothers, this type of thing. Uh, it gets also into the areas of tasks, getting things done, being a boss, being a fisherman, the salt. <clears throat> These are all metaphors that are trying to help us understand and get the nuances that are incorporated in leadership and followership. Um, in the New Testament, too, you see some changes. When Jesus was using a lot of the metaphors, seeds and the sower and the sheep, um, very rural in their context, right? By the time we move to Paul, who is dealing much more in the cities, the urban settings, urban as defined in that era, um, now you talk about gyms, you talk about stadiums, you talk about schoolrooms, you talk about uh, what are those things you wear when you, wreaths that you wear when you, you're victorious, you receive one of those. Those type of things. So it changes once you go from rural to, to urban, um, they change. <clears throat> so here's another question for you. What, let's take it into our context today. What are then some of the postmodern equivalents of servant leaders today? In the postmodern world.
What are they? Got to talk in this class. <laughs> What's that? It's an open-ended question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no right what answer. By, what do you mean by postmodern? Today's world. It's definitely more urban than rural. It's going to be more urban. Definitely going to be more urban. Oh, is this my little button here? So give me one. Employee play. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with uh, the, the 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 series called the Undercover Boss? Familiar with that? Where the boss becomes an everyday worker in the organization, undercover. Nobody knows he's the boss. He goes out and he does everything like they do, whatever. And I've seen him do it, you know, from sewage to <laughs> and the boss is doing all this stuff. But what is he doing? He's learning. He's being a listener. He's learning what his people put up with on a day-by-day -day basis. He learns about their home life and the issues that they're facing, a sick child or something of that nature and how they're trying to make ends meet and how they're worried about losing their job. The undercover boss goes undercover to listen to his, his workers so that he can make his business better. There you go. That's one. They're more uh, postmodernists are more interested in uh, what's real, answering the question what's real. That's real. Uh, those looking for embodiment of servanthood uh, yeah. and leadership, both. Um, and servanthood as really an identity, and not just a strategy for ah, or there you go. To, to become leaders or become in positions of yeah. leadership, but really to embody yeah. as an identity. Yeah. That's what uh, workers are looking for, or, uh, folks who are quote unquote subordinates. Yeah. The, uh, so like undercover boss, I think is a great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's really interesting, many of those bosses break down at the end <laughs> once they see what their people are going through and, and try to make it better working environment, do what they can to help and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. No identity issue, that's really good and for this generation. Mm -hmm. Which Bible characters define servant leadership for us? Hmm. <laughs> okay, th that doesn't count. <laughs> you gotta gotta come up with some other ones. He is one, yes, but we've gotta go beyond that. Who who who's the servant leader out there in Scripture? Who's defined that way? or even not defined, but by his actions or her actions, you see servanthood. It's not that many. I don't think. I don't know. Yeah. Who, who would you say? Stephen. Stephen. Why? Okay. Be a servant, okay. Serve, serve mm -hmm. in a very particular way uh, of, a, of a different ethnicity and a different gender. Mm -hmm. Okay. Himself. Uh huh. And um, but how, you know, however, uh, based on his courageous uh, words and leadership, uh, you know, under a lot of pressure, you see the, the the courageous side of leadership come out. Okay. Not only the servant. Yeah. 
Good. Who was that? Paul. Okay. And goes and out to be a leader, but in faithfully serving the position that God gave him as the calling that God called him to, people look to him as a leader. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking about the action. So Jesus' disciples in feeding the thousands. Okay. So serving the, the yes, group there. The mm -hmm. Yeah. Distributing the food, picking up the food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moses, anyone? Yeah. He, he's, he's named that, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Any females you can think of that demonstrated servanthood in there? Deborah. Yeah. David protected his flocks, all his uh, possessions, and he went down and asked for, um, asked for something. And the guy refused him, his wife. Uh. <laughs> so she was serving her husband and protecting the guy and, and going out there and, uh, providing and stopping the from killing just destroying everything yeah right serving her husband yeah good good one good one do you have another one Grace it's women is Dorcas Okay. Yeah, Dorcas. Uh -huh. kind of to uh, four people. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Good one. Good. Yeah, there's there's actually a lot of examples if you start you start thinking about um, even Barnabas um, introducing just being a person to introduce somebody to somebody else to get them accepted playing that middleman role there. Yeah, lots of them in there. Okay, another one, um, and this is great for basically intergeneration, any generation, but hospitality. And um, Nuan here uh, talks about, it's not to change people, hospitality, he's looking at hospitality, saying it's not to change people but to offer them space where change can take place. Hospitality, what's that involve? Usually involves some kind of food, right? You have to have food and drink, right? And that's, see that's what makes a class, right? If we don't have any food and drink, we just, it's just terrible, it's a, you know? But if we have food and drink in our class, it just, it changes the atmosphere and <coughs> Hospitality is one of the greatest ways of demonstrating servanthood. <clears throat> it's not to change the people, but to offer them space where change can take place. It's a, you get relaxed, right? And you start talking, and then the, it gets more, you become more vulnerable, more things come out, and then pretty soon the dialogue's going back and forth, and Things happen. Okay. Um, one of the greatest demonstrations, and it was brought up, Jesus, of course, being that servant leader that he was. And one of the greatest demonstrations of that, of course, is when he did wash the disciples' feet. Uh, of course, this was custom for the day. But it wasn't custom for the leader to wash feet. Who washed feet during those times? It was the slaves who washed the feet, right? That was their role. And because um, traveling around, of course, you get dirty, you come in, that's one of the things you do. Uh, this picture, interesting, this came from Chiang Mai, where you have an Indian washing a Korean's feet there. Uh, that was really fun. So I got a good picture of Sam and, and Han Sun Kim. <coughs> Um, 
But once again, the, the trinity of the story symbol and ritual here, these come into play. You can see them come into play. And once again, it will tell you what is something very important within Christianity. And that is washing of feet. That, that ceremony is one of those uh, things that define Christianity. In this case, what is servanthood within Christianity. And the stories, of course, will take you, you have what happened in 1 Corinthians 15, but where's it gonna take you? It takes you back to Jesus's story, right? About communion and what he did there. But it takes you also clear back into the Old Testament where you get the Passover, right? That that's there. And so you see the stories that are connected to that. And the symbols, of course, are what? You have the basin there and you have the towel there, okay? So um, here at Biola, on every semester, new semester, when they have the first convocation, um, the new people, the new students, transfer or new whatever, who come in and are sitting up front, and each of them receive a towel. A towel, okay? This isn't to wipe their sweat off, just, you know, when they do. It's, it's a reminder what? They are servants of God, and we want all graduates to be <coughs> servants of God. So they use this symbol of a towel to, they give it to them, and um, that's what it's for. So you remember through symbols that you are to be a servant. And then the ritual, whenever you do communion, so that's, it's, you know, cer certain churches do it so many times and every week or s every month or once a year or whatever it happens. So once again, it, it shows you, how many of you have had your feet washed by, in, a, in a ceremony like this, a foot washing ceremony? Have we did almost, only about half interestingly. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who have, what, what was it like to have somebody wash your feet? What was it like? I mean, that's not one of our customs, right? I mean, that's, that's an Asian custom. It's not something that we normally do. What was it like for you to have somebody wash your feet? Ah, special connection, yeah, special connection. What else? It feels embarrassed. Uh-huh, embarrassment. Yeah, but because of the meaning that you, you just let it go, you just, oh, you're taking it. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, there is an embarrassment to it, yeah, yeah. So what, in my, the village context makes you dead? Because they walk bare feet and yeah. they're dead. So uh-huh. So that's pretty common for you guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Do you use it as a, as a, uh, more than just a cleansing, but well, as a, as a, like this, as a, as yeah, a, the Easter, you know, one of those, uh, yeah, 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 do you feel the embarrassment that Susanna mentioned, or, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, Oh yeah, I mean it's just like everybody's feet has to be washed and somebody has to wash, you know. Do they separate the genders? No. So anybody can female, male, male, it's female, it doesn't matter. Well, that's what I didn't get <laughs> Now she's really shaking. <laughs> yeah. It's just a story, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have friends that do um mission trips to Moldova, which is the eastern oh. part of Romania. And one of the main things they do, they have like um, different teams that do different things, but one of the main things, they have feet washing. 
and you know they hump, they wash <coughs> the people's feet. Yeah. And in that they, you know, as you're sitting there washing somebody's feet, and you're basically giving them a pedicure. These are people that you know <laughs> do walk around barefoot because yeah. they're poor and everything, and they can't believe that wow, you came all the way from America to wash, wash my feet. feet, and it's such a amazing time wow. to actually share the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an awesome Yeah. Wow. That's neat. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's like that picture, right, where you have an Indian with a Korean. It's one thing you have a Korean, a Korean, or American, American, or Romanian, Romanian, but, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> For Koreans, does it really mean something? Someone wash your feet? Yeah, but we don't do that yeah. usually. Yeah, but yeah. that is, you know, special case. Um, when church doing uh, certain level of they, they when you graduate, um, they all the kind of things, uh, huh. you know, feet washing. Uh -huh. But it's not common. No, no. So yeah. if he's too much sorry to somebody, you know, wash yeah. my feet. Yeah. <laughs> Because for Indians, it's, it's very humiliating for uh, yeah, the I mean, man yeah. to touch someone's feet like that. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. there you have... Only, only the untouchable. Yeah. 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 We can't, you know, the older people to uh, wash you. Well, that's the younger people's feet, yeah. <laughs> That's one reason I included yeah. that because you have a gray-haired yeah. Indian fella here washing a younger Korean's feet. Yeah. Yeah. How tall is it that much younger? No, he is. <laughs> he must dye his hair though. See. <laughs> well, what do you think would be equally as? Um, is there some? Is there an activity that? doesn't have to be ritualistic. I mean, this isn't, foot washing wasn't exactly um, ritualistic. No. It was yeah. just done by servants, by this class mm -hmm. distinction. But what, what do you think is um, equivalent yeah. today that would, that would be actually, is there anything or would it be uh, cultural, culturally particularized, yeah. you know, in certain activities? Yeah. Or would it be, I mean, I can understand the shame factor of, 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 of Asians having someone else do that for me, mm -hmm. no matter who it might be. Mm -hmm. um, just like it would be for uh, a pastor to cook food in the kitchen in, in the Korean church. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps in East Africa, more, you know, on two cultures, it's a little more, there's a little more equity mm. in the ways that we deal with the, the, the dirty and things like that. There might be a little bit more. But yeah. What would be equally as yeah. shameful slash uh, embarrassment or some, some of that, I'm not sure. I, I think it maybe had to do with, maybe like you were saying, brother, uh, employee, employer, mm -hmm. uh, reversal. It's the role reversal, role reversal. Yeah. That is so central here in what he did. Because he wasn't considered the slave, right? So, but he took that role of a slave right. to do that. So, what, yeah, that's a great question. So that, and that's, actually, thank you for introducing. That was my next point. <laughs> next question. What is... A, an equivalent for today that would have that role reversal. For Asians, it's, it's more easier for us to think of like a gesture or uh -huh. who entered the room first, who opened okay. the door for whom, okay. who will take the choice of the seat, yeah. the best seat. Yeah. Mm -hmm, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Who Directly opposite to the lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There we go, Grace. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> like, for, uh -huh. for Asians, it's, it's more easy for us to to notice. Okay, oh, that's the great. Like yeah. that's the person who sure. really humble himself. Or, but I'm not sure in the Western culture. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good good illustration though. I'm trying to think of like in France or a high power. Maintaining power distance. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, 
like for me, uh, just trying to think in that context, I can't think of maybe any action, but maybe in the way that one speaks to someone else, one can show that deference to the other. Yeah. Um, but not necessarily an action that I can think of, but maybe the words they use or how they speak to another person that can show deference and show kind of certain <coughs> attitude. Uh -huh. Yeah, got to be some equivalents out there. And think if we would do it in this class. I've done it in this class before. But, um, and when not everybody knows each other, you know, so now you have an issue of this is a stranger yet. I don't know that person. I really don't know that. Yeah, we're fellow students, but that's about it. You know, we don't know our backgrounds. <clears throat> yeah, what is the 21st century equivalent in your culture? Where there's enough role reversal that it's very evident that something's turned upside down. Something is turned up. I mean, what, what if a Korean pastor did go down and go cooking, <laughs> what would that do? I mean, is that too much? <clears throat> well, it's very embarrassing for, uh, as a visiting speaker, pastor, in a uh, second, third, well, it's the first, second, and third generation uh, Brazilian, uh, Korean Brazilian church. Uh, and they actually, uh, because there's actually, a, a, there's a deference on, on different levels on both the Portuguese Brazilian side, African Brazilian side, European Brazilian, as well as the mm -hmm. Korean side, especially Korean side. So I, I told them, hey, if I, um, is it okay if I just have fun and, and serve <laughs> dinner with you guys to um, a bunch of you know, new people? It's basically a, a, an event where they invite guests to come in. And they, they refuse to let me do it, but I say, hey, if I'm, if I'm really part of your family, I just want to help out and serve. And so um, they were actually, you know, I mean, in the end, they, we had a good time, but it took them a few more or, minutes yeah. to, yeah. To, you know, to get used to it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that, that took that took some time. It yeah. was definitely some role reversal, yeah. and the Korean pastors were definitely not used to you know, other pastors serving them. Uh huh. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jesus was good at that role reversal stuff, uh, and he was he was flipping the world upside down <laughs> about everything he was doing. Right, the first and we last. Whoa! I mean, you know, what what's going on here? I think that it's just in our in our day and age. It's so there's a lot in the Asian context. There's a lot of false humility that comes with some of the service. Uh -huh. Because in our urban culture, uh, there is a lot of you know like utilitarian philosophy or utilitarian action. You're trying to be a servant in order to get them to follow you, and so therefore <laughs> you do as much as you can as a servant up to a certain point, uh -huh. and then you and then you forget about it. <laughs> it's time to go back to the true roles, <laughs> true positions. And mm -hmm. So I, I've seen that a lot mm. in our, um, but I think in a traditional Asian cultures, in cultures, it's a little more, it can be a little more authentic, a little more genuine. Mm. Good. Role reversal, yeah. This is interesting when you do a little comparative study here, uh, taking the John 13 there. And basically, he, he knew his time was just about up, right? So, I mean, this was work. He knows he's coming to the end here. And um, he knows, too, that, you know, I mean, he could call the angels. He could do whatever he wanted to do. A power was there and available to him, but he chose not to take advantage of, or, to, or to use that, I should say. And he knew that Judas was going to betray him. And yet he did then took that role reversal and became the slave who washed their feet. <clears throat> and you, you just wonder too what they were thinking when they when he washed their feet. What was going through their minds? What were they thinking? What is he doing washing my feet? You know, I mean, you can think of um, you know, Peter. He you probably expressed a few thoughts. <laughs> May not have got recorded there, but. Peter can't keep his mouth shut. So you would wonder what Peter would be saying about Jesus washing his feet, you know. But then you look at Pilate, and he's uh, he coming from the exact opposite side of the coin.
coin here where don't you know that I've got the power to either let you live or let you die? That's right here. I have that power. And then he takes a basin and he washes his hands for what? So that I'm not, this is, I'm no longer part, I don't have any association with this. I wipe myself, I wash myself clean of this situation here. It becomes very self-serving. Just a total contrast. <clears throat> so I mean, there's something you can look at. What is, what becomes self-serving in a, in a community and what becomes um, self-sacrificing? And that role reversal uh, would good if, give us the equivalent that we do need to be able to have that. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.